good afternoon. I uh, I want to spend the next couple of minutes going over the book, uh, How Democracies Die, and kind of going over the introduction in chapter one, which you will be reading the PDF that will be uploaded and published. And you will read that, and then there's an assignment attached to this. So I want to spend few minutes talking about uh, the introduction in chapter one to this book and give you a little background, a little context, so that as you're reading this, you you know what you're getting into and you're not coming to it cold. So um, the purpose of this book is really simple. The purpose of this book is very simple. Is our democracy in danger? That is, that is the, the question the writers are Posing. That is the question they're trying to answer, and they use um, information from political science and from sociology and psychology and different fields in the social sciences to address this question. They are two Harvard professors who have really studied American and global political governing systems and have a, a really big large grasp on how governing systems and political systems work. So at this time, I think it's important to distinguish the two. The two ideas are, are different. They're related, but different. Political, when somebody says political institutions, political systems, they're talking about systems that are uh, political parties, elections, voting, anything that has to do with that politics recruiting a candidate to run uh, the political end but the governing is what happens once a political party wins so a political party wants to get elected so that it can govern and then governing is dealing with the institutions and establishing and creating and enforcing and interpreting laws so governing is about laws. Governing is about doing things with legislation and laws to rule. Politics is about getting to that place. So uh, in the United States, we, we have political institutions and we have governing institutions. And those institutions rely heavily on certain norms and standards of behavior. So for two centuries, political parties and governing institutions created unwritten rules, unwritten standards um, and guidelines for their behavior. And doing so, they did so to continue the idea of democracy. They did that so that democracy would continue. Um, political parties, yes, they want to govern, but they also want to ensure that democracy continues to exist. So they set up these standards of behavior and that that was in existence for centuries. And that's just a, some quick kind of background. The Then as these authors get into their introduction, because one of them does have a little bit, of, uh, has some expertise in foreign countries, begins to lay out in great detail um, how democratic countries, Venezuela would be one of them, um, what was, they were democratic up to a point and then an election happened and they ceased to be democratic over time. The democratic institutions, the governing institutions failed them and a leader was able to exploit those shortcomings and take the once democratic country into a authoritarian dictatorship. This is, um, this is seen in Venezuela. It's seen with the election of Adolf Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, where people uh, were elected democratically through a democratic process and then use that very democratic process to deconstruct the institutions to serve their own purposes. So what's authoritarianism? Just to be clear, uh, it's a type of government 
where a person or a small group rules with complete and absolute power. That the rule of law does not apply equally. There's may or may not be any sort of rights and freedoms guaranteed to individuals or maybe just guaranteed to certain individuals. They're heavily monitored. So authoritarianism is, is where you have a, a small group of people or an individual uh, ruling with complete and absolute power and not paying attention to rule of law or any sort of human rights. So that's a lot of the introduction. So don't get bogged down when they're talking about Venezuela or Germany or Italy or some of the other countries they talk about. Don't let that take you off the track. They're only using that conversation of, with these other countries to illustrate a point. The conversation about these other countries is to help illustrate how democracies fail, right? That these democracies fail through democratic means. So in American democracy, See, we have two guardrails. We have two things that protect American democracies, political parties and governing institutions. Political parties need to weed out authoritarian figures. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but the sort of general consensus about political parties is that if a person who was too radical was coming through, the political party would coalesce around another candidate and and find the more mainstream candidate. That the, the political party is the apparatus, the thing that keeps um, real radicals and real people who have an authoritarian tendency out of power because you can only gain governing power through a political party. If the political party is, a, is really the gatekeeper it needs to be, then in fact, the authoritarian can't break through. That's, that's one. But if an authoritarian were to break through, you would hope that your governing institutions would be able to constrain them, would be able to check them, would be able to keep them from gaining too much power. And that's, that's sort of the strength of a bureaucracy. That's sort of the strength of various governmental agencies and organizations that would exist that would try to keep a check on that person. Um, in our country, we have three branches of government which check each other. So the hope is that the um, Congress will check the president and not let the president gain too much power, right? And there's a Supreme Court can check both of them. And so through this checks and balances, there is a, a way to kind of constrain and limit power. Um, So the question is, will autocratic leaders subvert democratic institutions or be constrained by them? The idea that if you do have an autocratic leader, if you do have someone come into power, um, does that person who's coming into power, where will the institutions constrain that person or will that person be smart enough to deconstruct those from the inside? So two things that really kind of speak to a healthy democracy are forbearance and mutual toleration. Forbearance is restraint. It's a fancy word for restraint. The leaders that we have are going to restrain themselves from going all in and saying, I'm going to be the king. You know, George Washington was famous for that restraint. He walked away after two terms. He could have been king for life. He walked away. So this forbearance is just something that is an, an unwritten rule among the leaders that we've had to sort of restrain themselves and not take full advantage of the power granted to them. The second is mutual toleration. It's a respect between, between the two political parties. The two political parties have to respect each other. They have to deem each other both legitimate. We may disagree on policy, but you are, your right to exist and think is legitimate. 
we may disagree on this foreign policy or this fiscal policy, but your right to exist and your belief, your right to your belief is protected. And that's what mutual toleration is. And those two things, when those two things are working, when those two things are engaged, then we certainly have a healthy democracy. But when social media and news, news consumption begin to break down the idea of mutual toleration, when the other gets painted as an enemy, um, when that begins to break down and leaders no longer practice that restraint, then our democracy is struggling. So how does a, how does a radical person come to be in power if political parties are supposed to check that and be the gatekeepers? And, and usually and what has happened historically, and this is what the, the writers are saying, is that in times of great crisis, usually great economic crisis, Parties are desperate, and parties will open their gate a little bit wider than normal, a little bit bigger, and allow other pe people they wouldn't normally let in. So in times of great crisis, you see political parties opening that gate just a little bit wider to let somebody in who will not practice forbearance, will not be tolerant of others' beliefs, and will um, sort of reject out of hand the, the other. So political parties should vet candidates. They should keep them from becoming legitimate. But in that time of great economic crisis or political or social crisis, you start to see cracks in that, in that first line of defense, which is political parties. They make what the writers call the devil's bargain. And that's what the writers term it, but it's, it's the idea that you will reach out to someone and, um, and let somebody in you might not normally. There are four key indicators of authoritarian behavior. So when a person does take over, you'll see four major uh, indicators that this is actually an authoritarian ruler. And the first is the rejection of democratic rules of the game. So just rejecting outright um, election or election results, or, or calling into question various ideas um, around the idea of elections and voting. Um, th these are all very real um, ideas. They, they tend to reject things that or intentionally misinterpret things that would be in the Constitution. Um, they, they tend to overstate their constitutional power. Um, they, they really do st strive to question the legitimacy of elections and electoral rules. So that's one. Two, um, they deny the legitimacy of the political opponent. So if, you're, if you are opposed to that person, your very legitimacy is called into question. Your very legitimacy as a person, as a, as a thinker, as a, as a rational being called into question. They're, they're going to completely discount you. Three, um, they're going to encourage or tolerate violence, depending on which side it is. If it's violence committed by people who support them, they tolerate it. If it's violence that they can use to encourage more sympathetic support for themselves, they will continue to encourage that violence. So there's there's uh, the third one, and the fourth one um, is very self-explanatory. I mean, they are they will be ready to, and they will begin to cut or curtail or limit the civil liberties of their opponents. And the people who look like them, the people who support them, their civil liberties are fine; they're never questioned. But if you don't meet the, if you don't if you don't fit with the what the group looks like, what this leader looks like, what this leader wants, what this leader is, is pushing for, then your civil liberties will be cut. So I mentioned this smoke-filled back room. And in the smoke-filled back room in 1920, a bunch of like nine men basically decided the Republican presidential nominee, even though that nominee had only received like 65 delegates out of a needed 450 or something right? 
William Harding became the nominee. He was in fourth place going into the convention. He was in first, fourth place. And in the smoke-filled back room, nine men got together and just appointed him the Republican, uh, Republican nominee. That being said, uh, that being said, they, uh, he won, and he had a really bad hurt, a really bad term as president. There are advantages and disadvantages to that, obviously, right? The disadvantages are, are of course, it's not very democratic. You had nine men choose, and these nine men picked the one they wanted, and that's not democratic at all. But the advantage is the people they didn't pick probably would have been worse. Um, may have had some authoritarian tendencies, and so you can. You have to see both sides of that coin. Um, it's not very democratic, but these nine men picked a guy who was incompetent and a bad president, but he was an authoritarian. He didn't take our country to a dangerous place. So um, that is that is kind of the end of chapter one, and you will read um, the introduction in chapter one. Um, I, I want you to kind of, as you're reading that, those chapters, annotate them, annotate, make notes about paragraphs, um, understand, kind of try to make sure you understand what you're reading. Um, and, and if you have questions, obviously you can email me. Um, I'll be glad to, glad to answer your questions. Um, so, uh, don't, you know, don't hesitate to ask for help if you need it. Um, like I said, this, this lecture will be posted in the group and the PDF will be there and the assignment will be there as well. So good luck and uh, questions, let me know. Peace.